Hello, and welcome to our online lecture for Psych 1101 and Psych 1010 at Lanier Technical College. My name is Michael Holman. I am a psychology instructor here at Lanier Tech, and I will be your narrator. Please note that these lectures are intended to assist you in better understanding the material and should not be considered a substitute for attending lecture, reading the text, or completing your assignments. With that said, let's get started on the voyage through the lifespan. This is a discussion on human development. So we will explain prenatal development and the role that sex hormones play. We will explain the physical, cognitive, moral, and social and emotional development of children. We will explain all of those things for adolescents or teenagers. We will also explain all of those things for adults. So true or false? Your heart started beating when you were only one-fifth of an inch long and weighed a fraction of an ounce. That is true. Prior to six months or so of age, out of sight is literally out of mind. That is also true. The architect Frank Lloyd Wright designed New York's innovative spiral-shaped Guggenheim Museum when he was 65 years old. That is also true. Alzheimer's disease is a normal part of aging. That is false. So, we are going to start at the very beginning. We're starting with prenatal development. So, we all start out as two separate things. These things are known as gametes. You got a sperm and you have an egg, and the two combine. Chromosomes can be either XX, meaning female sex characteristics, or XY, meaning male sex characteristics. However, as you will see, this is not always the case. As we grow, we do what's called maturation. We mature. We grow into a full-fledged human. There are three trimesters in terms of developing within the womb. In the first trimester, this is when sperm met egg, and thus a zygote was created. A zygote is just a fertilized egg. From being a zygote, you will eventually transform into an embryo. This lasts from two weeks to eight weeks after conception. And then you will be a fetus, which is from eight weeks until the day you are born. The first trimester is known as the germinal stage. This takes place from conception through implantation. The zygote will divide and become implanted in the uterine wall. At the embryonic stage, this occurs from implantation, so it's attached to the uterine wall, until about the eighth week of pregnancy. During this time, major organ systems are formed, such as your genetic code, XX or XY, causing sex organs to differentiate. This includes Y sex chromosomes. For example, in males, the Y sex chromosome kicks in and causes testes to form and for your body to begin to produce androgens. Fun fact that not a lot of students may realize is that most people, actually all people, are born with a female body. We're all born as a female template. That Y chromosome doesn't kick in until the embryonic stage. In fact, the clitoris turns into an enlarged penis. Ovaries transform in the testes and descend. Uh, the labia will actually become the scrotum or the sac on men. So all of this happens thanks to that Y chromosome. That's a lot of stuff going on. And as we will see, Nature can be surprisingly unpredictable. Within the embryonic stage, the embryo is suspended in an amniotic sac. Nutrients and waste are exchanged with the mother through placenta, and the embryo is connected to the placenta by an umbilical cord. From the embryonic stage, we enter the final trimester, the fetal stage. This is the beginning of the third month until birth. It is characterized by maturation and gains in size. So again, we have the germinal stage, the embryonic stage, and the fetal stage. 
of prenatal development. Now, one thing we need to talk about is zygotes and twinning. So the way a zygote works is that you have an egg, you have a, sp a sperm, the two combine, form a zygote, and then the zygote starts dividing. It starts multiplying. It starts becoming a person or an organism of some kind. And so it begins to divide and divide and divide, and usually all of these cells dividing within the zygote will form an organism. But sometimes zygotes just keep dividing and keep dividing to the point where they actually will split into two separate individuals that came from the same zygote. When this happens, we call them monozygotic twins. You might know them as identical twins. Dizygotic twins are similar, but they didn't quite go through the same process. During the fertilization period, it turns out mom and dad were just really fertile, and in fact, two eggs were fertilized by two different sperm. And so these twins are essentially siblings growing or being developed in the womb at the same time. Monozygotic, meaning one zygote, and dizygotic, meaning two zygotes. So that makes sense. However, when talking about identical twins and how those, zygo those zygotes can split and become someone else, we have to talk about conjoined twins. This occurs when the twins are actually joined together at the point in which the cell masses of the zygote remain stuck. So usually when a zygote splits and becomes monozygotic twins, it will split completely. But with conjoined twins, it just stopped somewhere in the process, just at some point. And at that point where it stopped, the twins continued to grow as one organism. So you can see many different images of conjoined twins here. Uh, this is just another example of how nature does not follow our rules. It does not follow our expectations. When we get to the emotion motivation chapter, you'll see even more examples of how that is very relevant. Uh, here's an example of a very famous case of conjoined twins. You can actually see in this chart here where the zygote began to split to make them identical twins at the head, or what would be eventually become the head. And so they even developed, you know, separate heads, separate brains, separate necks, separate sets of lungs, separate hearts. But right here is where the zygote stopped dividing. And from there, they grew, continuing to grow, into one person. And so that's why they essentially have two heads. They actually have a fantastic documentary out that they put out themselves uh, on their 16th birthday, uh, showing them where they both went to get uh, their own driver's licenses just to be safe. Uh, they both are perfectly happy and they function well within society. Uh, I recently learned more information about them as adults. They are actually school teachers. And it's really cool because while one teacher can be lecturing and writing on the board, the other teacher will actually be monitoring the class to make sure kids aren't talking and whatnot. So when we are learning and studying behavior in the womb, we use something known as a fetoscope. In a famous experiment done in 1980, DeCasper and Pfeiffer would use a fetoscope while their mothers read to their unborn children the story The Cat in the Hat. And then, later, after the children had been born, the same story was read to them again, and they would monitor their pacifier movement. And what they found was that these children actually were showing signs of recognition, that they recognized The Cat in the Hat from when they were still in the womb. Of course, these were in the late stages of the trimester. We also know that there is a correlation, remember that's just a relationship, between fetal heart rate variability and toddler behavior. So what this means is that if while you're pregnant you have a very active pregnancy, so it feels like the baby's doing gymnastics in there for example, then it means you're probably going to have a very active baby. Now teratogens are anything that can affect mom while she's pregnant that will then affect the baby. So these can be maternal illnesses like chickenpox, HIV, alcohol and drugs, caffeine, smoking, a poor diet, pollution, 
and even maternal stressors. So on top of everything else, mom has to make sure that she doesn't get too stressed out. This is just an exhaustive list of all the different teratogens and the effects that they may have on an unborn child. So feel free to pause this video and take a look at all these different things if you're interested. This is a continuation of that list, but instead of talking about drugs, we're now talking about diseases or a specific kind of condition. And so you can see what this will do to the baby as well upon birth. All right, so that was developing in the womb, but now you're born. Congratulations. You have now just entered childhood. When talking about infancy and childhood, we have to talk about the major milestones that most people encounter when they are developing both physically and from a motor perspective. Motor is in movement, by the way. We also will measure things like perceptual development, such as visual perception. So we'll use things like the visual cliff experiment, the habituation technique, auditory perception, and on and on. We also will monitor for reflexes. Reflexes are simple, unlearned, stereotypical responses that are elicited by specific stimuli. Things like rooting or sucking, having a withdrawal moment, being startled, grasping, anything like that. This is all just natural behaviors that babies tend to do. We also monitor motor development. So we look at your brain maturation and environmental factors. Here's a handy chart for understanding where your baby needs to be in terms of motor development. By about 16 weeks, they should be able to turn from their stomach to their side. By 28 weeks, they're sitting up. By 36, they've started crawling. By about around 52 weeks, they're standing up. They've started walking at 64. And by 80 weeks, they are walking out the door. When talking about perceptual development, we know that within days, infants can track moving light, and that by two months, infants prefer human faces as visual stimuli. We know this by measuring their fixation time, or how long they would stare at specific visual stimuli. And you'll see an example in a moment. We also know that they perceive death about the time that they begin crawling, which is absolutely an evolutionary advantage. This brings us to the, vis the visual cliff experiment. So this is an interesting experiment, another example of psychologists being jerks. What we would do in this experiment is we would get a big glass table and below that glass table is a checkerboard pattern. So it's very easy to see that the floor is below this glass table, but obviously you can see through the glass table. And then we'll have mom on one side of the table and the baby on the other. And the mom will clap her hands and encourage the baby to come to her and what the baby does in response to the, his mother calling him will tell us whether they ha are able to perceive death or not so for example if the baby just crawls right over the glass top of the table and goes right to mom then we know that that baby does not have a proper perception of depth because it should see that there's nothing there. So it's actually better if the baby, when mom calls, stays on its side of the table and just cries. Why? Because it sees the checkerboard floor below, but it doesn't realize that there is a table between it and its mother. And so it thinks that there is a cliff, a visual cliff, between it and mom, and so it cries because it thinks it can't get to mom. So. That is just an example of how, one way that we can study to see if babies are perceiving depth or not. Here is another famous experiment that we did. Uh, we would show discs to babies, and by about two to three months old, we would measure how long they stared at each disc. This is known as their fixation time. And as you can see, the yellow, the white, the uh, plum-colored discs, didn't really get a whole lot in terms of preference. The uh, interesting target got a little bit, uh, almost at 20% for just random words. But when we put a human's face on the disc, 
They stared at that one overwhelmingly more than any of the others. When talking about physical development, we need to also talk about perceptual development in terms of hearing. Newborns hear normally and tend to prefer mother's voice, but they show no preference for father's voice. Why? Well, because they've been hearing mom in the womb the whole time. So she is more familiar, at least on an instinctual level. And so that connection is already going to be there. This is actually why we encourage fathers to talk to their babies in the womb so that at least they can try to have some kind of connection or familiarity with their father's voice once the baby is born. When talking, oops, sorry, when talking about temperament, there are two different styles. There's either an approach style temperament or a withdrawal style temperament. An approach style temperament is a very friendly baby, a baby that will approach anybody. A withdrawal style temperament is a baby that doesn't want to be around people, that will actively avoid being around others. This is typically based on nurturing experiences. So the more nurturing the environment, the more likely the baby is to be very friendly. Whereas if they've had a more harsh environment, then they're more likely to withdraw from other people. Now we talked about this before in previous uh, lectures, but we do need to talk about language in terms of babies. We know that behaviorists have theories in terms of observing other babies, or observing even adults, and that's how they develop their language. Uh, but there are also nativist theories, which believe in something called a language acquisition device, or a part of our brain that is naturally built to allow us to acquire new languages just by being around them. Interactionist theories simply say that both are right. And that tends to be the prevailing theory that most psychologists follow, that we develop language as babies based both on the adults that we are observing and what languages they're speaking, but also on our natural inborn tendency to develop language in the first place. Babies will tend to have child-directed speech, um, the goo goo ga, ga kind of stuff, but we'll also see overextension and underextension we'll learn that babies typically do understand certain rules of grammar, but that they're also guilty of two-word sentences, or telegraphic speech, as we call it. They also might fall victim to the over-regularization error, or assuming that just because your dog's name is Jeff, all dogs are named Jeff, for example. There is a critical period in a child's life when they can develop these different languages. Uh, it's usually around up to six, eight, sometimes nine. Uh, during this time period, children are really malleable in terms of understanding languages, and they can pick up a second or even a third language very quickly. This is just a handy chart to show you how the different genders uh, are affected by language development. So we know, for example, that girls tend to be much better at understanding and developing their own language than boys. They're just a little bit faster in terms of their comprehension. Okay, so up until this point, we've been taking a fairly chronological uh, stance or a chronological approach to how we are going to understand the stages of development. We've been saying you were conceived and then you were born and now you're a little kid. And while we're still gonna do that to an extent, I want you to, instead of focusing on the seven stages of development, know that they're here, they're right in front of you, but now you need to focus more on the theory. So take really good notes as I talk about the theories. Each of these theories will be relevant at each of these seven stages of development, which, just so you know, are prenatal, infancy, childhood, adolescence, young adulthood, middle adulthood, and late adulthood. The thing we need to talk about first is cognitive development. Remember, cognitive equals thinking. It is the way in which children mentally represent and think about the world. The big names that we're going to talk about today are Jean Piaget and his cognitive development theory, Lev Vygotsky and his sociocultural theory, and Lawrence Kohlberg and his theory of moral development. So they all have different 
ideas that they're talking about, and they've all been very influential. Piaget came up with something called the cognitive development theory. So we're talking about how you develop the ability to think. He said that our schemas, or mental structures that we use to organize knowledge, are involved in what we understand about the world around us, and that we will either assimilate new information or accommodate new information. Assimilation is to respond to new stimuli through existing habits. So you learn something new and you respond to it by doing what you've always done. Accommodation is to create a new way of responding to the object. So something new has entered your life and so you do something new in order to deal with it. Piaget had four stages of his cognitive development theory. The first stage is the sensory motor stage, it is the coordination of sensory information and motor activity. And the primary lesson that we learn in this stage is object permanence. Before six months of age, we do not mentally represent objects. And I'll go over this in detail in a little bit. Next, there is the pre-operational stage where we learn to use words and symbols to represent objects and relationships among them. We learn lessons on egocentrism, animism, artificialism, conserva conservation, all sorts of things. We also learn objective responsibility. There's also the concrete operational stage, which is the beginning of the capacity for adult logic. You learn about decentration and reversibility. You develop subjective moral judgment. So let's start back at the beginning. The first stage is object permanence. This is the knowledge that an object exists even when it is not in sight. By 8 to 12 months of age, object permanence begins to be mastered and is fully developed by the end of this stage. Okay, so object permanence is why peekaboo is so much fun for little babies. So if you've ever hid your face in front of a baby and they think you're gone just because you hid your face, and then you uncover your face and they think it's the best thing in the world. They think you just performed an amazing magic trick, right? Well, the reason why is because they haven't developed object permanence. If they can't see it, they think it's gone forever. So they really do think that you just disappeared. And that's amazing. This is also why you can hide a rattle under a blanket and they won't know where it is. Uh, you also see them... If a baby is in their high chair and they drop their food or their toy and you're looking at them and you're watching them and you know that they know that they just dropped their toy or their spoon, but now they're crying, right? And they think it is the worst thing that has ever happened to them in their entire lives. Why? Because that was their favorite toy, their favorite spoon, but they can't see it anymore, so they assume that it no longer exists. It doesn't exist if I can't see it. So the sensory motor period is from zero to two years old, with major achievements being object permanence and learning about imitation. The second stage is the pre-operational stage. This goes from two to seven years old. During this time, children tend to believe that what they see is literally true, but they're not yet capable of logical thought. For example, they will think that uh, the tooth fairy is real, that Santa Claus is real, Sorry if I just broke some bad news to some of you. I was, yeah. We were, we were hoping that you knew by now. But just in case, yes, I am sorry. Santa Claus is not real, just for those that are paying attention. Uh, but this becomes more important when talking about monitoring TV watching. So during this stage, uh, kids just believe whatever you tell them. They, if you've ever had a younger sibling, you know the power of this. You can look at your younger sibling who's in this age range and tell them, yeah, you were adopted, and they'll burst into tears, and they'll believe it, just because you told them so. Or you'll tell them, yeah, there's a monster that lives under your bed. They'll just believe it every single time. And so you probably, if you're an older sibling, experimented with this a little bit. One of the things that children during this stage learn is egocentrism. Children understand the world only through their own eyes and think others have the same viewpoint as well. So during this time, children will assume that whatever they see, that's what you see. Uh, there's a great demonstration of this where a little boy who's about 
four, maybe five years old. He's looking at a model volcano. And the instructor is with him, and she asks him to tell her what he sees. And when he's looking on his side of the volcano, he says he sees an owl, and he sees a goat, and he sees a tree. And then they switch places, and now he's looking at the other side of the volcano. And she asks him what he can see, and he says he can see a lake, he can see a bush, he can see a bird. And then the instructor says, well, what can I see from where I'm sitting? Now remember, he was just sitting where she is. And he had already said what she should be able to see, the owl, the goat, the tree. But what does he say? He says that she should be able to see the bird and the bush, everything that he can currently see. Why? Because he's still dealing with being egocentric. So he believes that whatever he sees, everyone else can see. So this lasts from two to seven years old, with the major achievement being a capacity for mental representation. You also will learn about things like egocentrism and conservation. And conservation is one thing that we measure in a famous uh, example called conservation of liquids. So what we'll do, as you can see in this slide, is we will have two glasses of water or juice, right? And they are both at the same amount. And this is done right in front of the child. And we'll ask them to tell us, does this glass have more juice? Does this glass have more juice? Or are they both the same? And the kids will look at it. They might measure a little bit, but they'll say, they're both the same. Great. So then the instructor will take one of these glasses and pour it into this longer, skinnier cylinder, as you can see here. And again, the instructor will ask them, does this glass have more juice? Does this glass have more juice? Or are they both the same? Children that have not mastered the concept of conservation will say that this glass has more juice simply because it's bigger. And so they assume it must somehow have more liquid in it. So that's an example of conservation. It is not until the end of this stage that this concept is mastered. The third stage is the concrete operation stage. It takes place between 7 and 12 years old. During this time, children can understand and problem solve for certain concrete concepts that are touchable or that they can picture in their head, but mental operations work poorly for abstract concepts like freedom or hypothetical ideas. So, for example, they could understand this question. If we said if A is longer than B and B is longer than C, the child would be able to figure out that A is also longer than C. This is in front of them, it's obvious, they can figure it out. They can do a little bit of problem solving. But abstract questions are a little more difficult. For example, if I asked you, Becky is taller than Mary and Mary is taller than Susie, so who is the tallest? A child struggling through the concrete operation stage would not be able to solve this until the end of this stage. So the concrete operation period is from 7 to 11, maybe 12 years old. And the major achievements include being able to take another person's perspective, learning to classify objects, conservation and other reversible mental operations. They're capable of logic and reasoning. They're capable of conservation and reversible thinking. Centration is gone because they can consider all features of an object, and they begin to ask questions regarding those early childhood fantasies, like Santa, and can come to logical conclusions. Then we have the final stage, the formal operation stage. This is from 12 years old to adulthood, and when you're here, it basically means you're fully developed mentally. You have learned all that you need. You have abstract thoughts understood. You can think of complex concepts like freedom and what that means and understand them. So by the formal operation stage, you are ready to go. The formal operation period is from 11 years old at the earliest, with major achievements being the ability to understand abstract concepts, logic, reversibility, and hypothetical thinking. When I say hypothetical thinking, I mean something like saying, what if dinosaurs were still on the planet? 
right? That's just using your imagination. That is a hypothetical situation. So that is hypothetical thinking, and that is what we master by the end of this stage. So what we're going to do for a few of these theories is we're, we're going to evaluate them. You know, how much of what they said was right and how much of what they said was wrong, essentially. One of the problems with Piaget's theory is that he tended to underestimate children's abilities. He said, if you're at this age, you're in this stage, and that's the end of it, period. This is all you can do. We also have learned that egocentrism and conservation appear to be more continuous than Piaget thought. So not everybody masters them by the time they're old enough to master them. And developmental sequences do not vary in Piaget's theory. He says that if you're this old, you're in this stage. If you're this old, you're in the next stage. And that they don't jump around. And if you've ever had an intelligent child that seems to be mastering these concepts earlier than what Piaget said they should be doing, then you can understand why this could be an issue. The next theory we want to talk about is Lev Vygotsky's sociocultural theory. This isn't about how we think. This is a theory about how we learn. It is a continuous theory focused on the influence of culture and children's interactions with elders. Vygotsky talks about something called the ZPD, the Zone of Proximal Development. This is the capacity of a child to solve a task on their own versus the capacity of a child to solve a task with adult guidance. So what are we talking about? What we are saying is that children are capable of learning new tasks. For example, if a child wants to learn how to swim, if they just jumped into the pool, they would most likely drown. They're not ready for it yet. They don't know what to do. It is beyond them. That is a task that they cannot do. However, if they jumped into the pool and had the assistance of a swim instructor, we would say that swimming is within their zone of proximal development because it's beyond what they can do without assistance. They would die. But it is within their grasp if they have an older adult to help them, someone that can guide them through the task. And eventually, thanks to that guidance, they will have mastered the task and are able to do it on their own. Once they are able to do it on their own, then it's no longer in their ZPD. Their ZPD shifts for them. So that is now easy. They move on to something harder that they can't do without assistance. And so it just keeps continuing. Scaffolding is this assistance. It is helping someone little by little until they get to the point where they've mastered the task entirely. One thing that's interesting is that Vygotsky found that children internalize explanations that encourage skill development. So they will hold on to any explanation that you give them as their mentor that they believe will help them to get better. So they will listen and they will remember that. The next theory we want to talk about is Lawrence Kohlberg's theory of moral development. So Kohlberg was very interested in studying how we develop morals and why we believe that certain behaviors are right or wrong. So Kohlberg would use a moral dilemma story to explore the reasoning of right and wrong. And this was a stage theory with a specific sequence, which we're going to talk about. So the first level of moral development, according to Kohlberg, is known as the pre-conventional level. It says that we base judgment on the consequences of our behavior. So we do things because we don't want to get in trouble, or something like that. At stage one, it's all about obedience and punishment. So we do this because we don't want to get in trouble. We do this because we were told to. At stage two, it's all about good behavior, which allows you to satisfy your needs. It allows you to get what you want. So now I'm going to be good because I'll get what I want. This is all still based on punishments and rewards. At the conventional level, we base our judgment on conformity to conventional standards of right and wrong. At stage three of this level, it's all about the good boy orientation. What that means is you want people to like you. You want people to think you're a good person. So that's why you believe that this is the morally correct decision to make. At stage four, judgments are based on rules that maintain social order. So now, you're going to make your decisions, you're going to decide that this is the right or wrong thing to do 
because that's the law. That's what it says to do. At the post-conventional level, we base our judgment on the need to maintain social order and personal conscience. And this is the highest level. So this is the final stage. So you base your judgment not on what might happen to you if you do something wrong, not on it's the rules or I want people to like me, but because you believe this is the right thing to do. Your conscience tells you this is the right thing to do, that this is for the best of everyone, so therefore I believe it is the morally correct thing to do. Here is an example of one of Kohlberg's dilemmas that he would ask his participants. To save his dying wife, Hines has to steal an expensive drug from a pharmacist who refuses to sell it at a lower price. Boys between the ages of 10 and 16 were asked to reason about the morality of his decision. Almost universally, all the boys in his study agreed that Hines did need to steal the drug, that it was the right thing to do. But then Kohlberg asked them, well, why was it the right thing to do? At the pre-conventional level, a boy would respond, if you let your wife die, you will get in trouble. Notice how it's focused on you and the consequences of doing this action. At the conventional level, if he lets his wife die, people will think he is heartless. So now the reason it's the right thing to do isn't because it's the law, which doesn't make sense because stealing is against the law, but instead because of social norms, social laws, you know, how other people see you. And finally, the post-conventional response. Human life is the highest principle. Everything else is secondary. People have a duty to save the lives of others. So the reason it was the right thing to do was because he had a duty to do it. It was morally the correct thing to do. So that's the difference in all those different responses to the same question. So remember, at the pre-conventional level of moral reasoning, the emphasis is on avoiding punishment and looking out for your own welfare and needs. Moral reasoning is selfish. It is self-oriented. At the conventional level of moral reasoning, moral reasoning is based on social rules and laws. Social approval and being a good citizen are what's most important. At the highest level, the post-conventional level of moral reasoning, moral reasoning is based on self-chosen ethical principles. Human rights take precedent over laws, and also you avoid self-condemnation for violating any of these rules. So let's evaluate Kohlberg's theory. Well, research suggests that moral reasoning does follow a sequence. It does go from pre to conventional to post-conventional. Most people, however, do not reach post-conventional level. This is also consistent with formal operational thought. The reason being that if you've ever known someone that said, this is the morally incorrect thing to do because my religion tells me it is, not because they think it's wrong, but because their religion tells them it's wrong, then they're staying at the conventional level. If they say it's the wrong thing to do because it goes against the law, whether or not the law is, say, just or not, then that is still the conventional level. Now, I always get in trouble for this. Uh, I want to make it clear. I'm not saying that believing in any sort of particular religion is a bad thing. What I am saying, though, is that if you base your moral decisions off of what someone else told you was the right thing to do instead of what is what you personally believe is the right thing to do, then Kohlberg would say that your level of moral reasoning is not fully developed. He would say that it is, at most, the conventional level. Post-conventional is just deciding that you moral, morally believe certain things are the right thing to do because of your own values, not because of what someone else told you you should believe. But there is a problem with this, and that is that Kohlberg underestimated the influence of social, cultural, and educational institutions and parents. Is it really any wonder that there are quite a few people that you might have heard the old expression, because the Bible says so, that kind of thing. Is it any wonder there are people that don't get past the conventional level then? Because it is a cultural design for us to believe things like that. Many people's cultures encourage them 
to believe what they are told, to obey authority, to always obey the law, things of that nature, right? So Kohlberg didn't necessarily consider that when making his theory. And so he underestimated the importance of society and how it can help you develop your own values. Continuing to critique, excuse me, to critique Kohlberg's levels of moral development, notice that they were gender specific. You might, any keen-eyed observer might have noticed that he only talked to boys. And that's because Kohlberg didn't believe that girls were capable of higher moral reasoning. He just didn't think it was within them. So he didn't bother talking to them. So he was quite sexist in that regard. He also did not make a distinction between reasoning or why you think it's the right thing to do and what you actually do or your behavior. He also did not consider your conscience or how even if you do behavior that goes against a moral belief, your conscience might come into play and make you feel bad about it. And he also didn't care about empathy or how some people might make moral decisions based on understanding the emotions that someone else is going through. Ironically, he would have probably discovered this and added it to his theory had he talked to girls who are very famously known for having more empathy than boys, typically. So, the next theorist that we're going to talk about is Eric Erikson and his psychosocial development theory. According to this theory, there are eight stages that represent life crises. Things like trust versus mistrust, autonomy versus shame and doubt, industry versus inferiority, all sorts of stuff. During each of these stages of social and emotional development, we will develop our own sense of self, our own self-concept, and our own identity. This includes our gender identity. So many times we will find in many cultures around the world that children will identify as a particular gender as early as three years old. Uh, and these children will let you know straight up, I'm a boy, I'm a girl. Uh, and this is true regardless of whether they may later as an adult identify as transgender. They will identify as the gender that they recognize themselves as. This has nothing to do with their uh, sexual organs. We often will assign a gender at birth based on your uh, sexual organs. Do you have a penis or do you have a vagina? But what we have begun to learn is that gender identity really isn't connected to having a penis or to having a vagina. It's actually connected to your self-concept. So how do you identify yourself? And this concept is developed incredibly early, as I said before, at around, as early as three years old. We'll discuss this in more detail when we get to the emotion and motivation chapter. As children learn and continue to develop, they will develop certain ideas about how a boy behaves and how a girl behaves. These are known as gender roles. And so, depending on the gender that they identify with, they will then fulfill those roles and do all the different activities that they think that a little boy or a little girl should do. And that changes depending on the culture that you're from. So. When talking about the development of our identities, we of course are talking about Erikson's psychosocial stages in adulthood. If we answer the right question in each of the crises in his eight stages, we will develop what's called a stable personality throughout adulthood. We will develop mature emotions. Erickson emphasized the impact of society and culture upon development, and that's him in that picture right there. This emphasis led to an increase in research on lifespan development. However, he was criticized for the lack of solid experimental data to support his ideas. Eight stages of development, each with a major issue or crisis that has to be resolved, are what make up his stage theory. And each stage is named after the two sides of the issue relevant in that stage. So let's talk about these stages. The first is trust versus mistrust. This takes place from the day you are born to about one years old. During this time, infants learn that they can or cannot trust others to take care of their basic needs. From one to two years old, you deal with autonomy versus shame and doubt. 
children learn to be self-sufficient and many activities like toilet training, walking, exploring. But if they're restrained too much, they learn to doubt their abilities and feel shame. By three to five years old, you're in the initiative versus guilt stage. Here, children learn to assume more responsibility by taking the initiative, but they will feel guilty if they overstep limits set by parents. From five years old to about puberty, we enter the first of one of the most important stages of Erickson's theory, and this is industry versus inferiority. This is also the age of elementary school, so children will learn to be competent by mastering new intellectual, social, and physical skills, or they'll feel inferior if they fail to develop these skills. So, for example, you might have a little kid that just tells you, I'm not good at math, I'm not good at English, I don't like to read, things like that, right? They have already begun deciding that they're not good at these things. And so what will happen is that as a teenager, as an adult, they will believe that they are inferior at them, and so they'll never even attempt to become better. When I was a kid, I was really good at academic stuff, at reading books and all that sort of thing, so I enjoyed that. I was answering industry for those questions about how to perform well in school. But I was not an athletic child, and the lesson that I learned from not liking sports was that I'm not good at sports because well when I would try to play basketball or something in the gym it didn't really go well for me and so I believed that I was inferior to sports that lesson stayed with me throughout my life even into my adulthood and so I still don't like sports and I still have a tendency to think that I wouldn't be very good at them so the lessons we learn in this fourth stage can stay with us and help to shape us as adults. The next stage, the fifth stage, hap takes place during adolescence or your teenage years. It is identity versus role confusion. During this time, adolescents develop a sense of identity by experimenting with different roles, but no role experimentation may result in role confusion. And the best way that I can illustrate this is with another story. So I knew a girl in high school that would change her personality and the way that she dressed depending on the guy that she dated. For example, let's say that she came to school one day and the guy she was dating was very preppy. Um, he came to, went to a Baptist church and he was very straight laced, right? Well, she would be the girl that wore khaki pants and uh, you know a polo shirt and maybe a pearl necklace, that kind of thing. Well, they break up. Fast forward to a few weeks later, she's got a new boyfriend. And this guy is super into grunge, which is a form of rock back in the 90s. Uh, and so she would come in with ripped jeans and flannel shirts, and you know she's wearing a uh, Nirvana band t-shirt and all that sort of stuff. And then they break up. And now, a few weeks later, she's dating a new guy. And this guy is a goth kid. So sure enough, she comes to school, and now she's wearing all black. She's got black fingernail polish. She's uh, dyed her hair black. She's got a spike collar. She's wearing black lipstick. She is changing her identity. She is experimenting with her identity using her boyfriends. And this is actually a perfectly normal thing to do. She doesn't know who she is, and so she's experimenting. Erickson actually said that if you don't experiment at all, then when you're an adult, you might become confused about who you are, what you're good at, uh, what you enjoy about yourself. So this becomes a very important stage as well. The sixth stage takes place during young adulthood, so your 20s to early 30s. It's known as intimacy versus isolation. During this time, young adults form intimate relationships with others, or they become isolated because of a failure to do so. So we're talking about forming strong, deep bonds with other adults that are important to you. And this also means serious relationships. When we're talking about intimacy, we are talking about sex. During the early 20s, being a young adult, this is when you usually start to become sexually active. And that means that you become intimate with people. 
Now, that's not to say that you can't have intimacy if you're still a virgin. Intimacy also means vulnerability. And so allowing yourself to be vulnerable with close friends, with family, with a boyfriend or a girlfriend, that is intimacy. You are choosing to make these relationships, to make these connections. The opposite of this is isolation. So if you choose to not have these relationships, to not allow yourself to be intimate, to put up a wall, maybe you just feel alone, maybe you don't know anybody, then you are choosing the answer of isolation. It is no surprise, and it is not unexpected, that suicide tends to occur amongst young adults. That is who it most occurs among. So the reason often is because of isolation. They feel alone. They have no other connections. So as we're getting into each of these stages, they're becoming more and more important. The seventh stage takes place during middle adulthood. So late 30s to about 50, 55 or so, maybe 60. And this is known as generativity versus stagnation. During this time, middle-aged adults feel they are helping the next generation through their work and child rearing, or they stagnate because they feel that they are not helping. So if you've ever heard of the dance moms or anything like that, this is what we mean by they believe that they're helping the next generation through their work and their child rearing. These adults believe that this is their opportunity to create a legacy, that their children are their legacy. If they don't have children, then they believe that their work, their job, maybe the stuff they do at a charity work, that is their legacy. So it's all about setting up the foundations for what they will leave behind once they're no longer here. You've also probably heard of something called the midlife crisis. This is what a lot of adults will go through if the answer during the seven states that they got was stagnation. If they feel that they're stagnant, that they're not doing anything, that they're not helping the next generation, that they haven't done anything worthwhile with their lives, then they might experience a midlife crisis. And what that means is you might have heard stories of men dumping their wives of 30 years and dating the hot secretary that's only 23 and uh, quitting their job and selling their car and now they drive a motorcycle and they drive around cross country, right? That's a classic example of a midlife crisis. And it's because they believe that they weren't doing anything with their lives and so they tried to change it. The final stage happens in late adulthood. So 55, 60 and up. And it's integrity versus despair. During this time, older adults will assess their lives and develop a sense of integrity if they find that their lives have been meaningful. If they don't think they've led a meaningful life, they will fall into despair. Moving on from Erickson, we're now going to talk about attachment. Attachment is an emotional tie between one animal or person and another specific individual. The main name that is applied to attachment theory is Mary Salter Ainsworth. She said that behavior defines attachment. And we know this if the child attempts to maintain contact while they're attached. So if they try to maintain contact, then that means that they have a strong attachment. If they have anxiety when they're separated from their parent, then they also have strong attachment. To study this, really to test it, Ainsworth came up with something called the strange situation. It was a method to assess the infant's response to separations and reunions with caregivers and a stranger. And what she would do is she would have mom come in with the child into a strange room and they would play in the room. Sometimes a stranger would be in the room, sometimes just mom. And so they're playing for a little bit until mom is signaled to leave. And so mom leaves and then she watches through a two-way mirror what the baby does next. If the baby screams and cries and is upset, then they would say they are on their way to having a good attachment. But most babies tend to do that. So what we have to know is what happens when mom finally returns. When we left this baby with a stranger or we left them all alone in the room, how did they respond? If mom comes back and the baby is able to quickly calm down and go back to playing, we call it a secure attachment because Mom has been consistent in being there often. If the baby is 
upset, but just kind of stays subdued and wants to stay with mom and doesn't really try playing anymore, they are avoidant. That means that they're confused. They don't really know what to do. Uh, mom left and they feel horribly betrayed. And then there's ambivalent or resistant attachment. And this one, not only do the children get upset when mom leaves, but when mom returns, they get even angrier. And mom's attempts to try and make them feel better fail because they're angry at mom for leaving. And when she came back, that should be the solution to the problem. But they're mad at mom for leaving in the first place. So that usually is an example of a parent that was inconsistent with how often they've been there for the child's needs. We'll often see this when talking about Erickson's first stage of trust versus mistrust. In this case, the child has learned the lesson of mistrust. Infants initially show indiscriminate attachment. They will just be friendly to anybody. But beginning about four months of age, they will develop the initial pre-attachment phase where they begin to develop some kind of attachment then they make that attachment during the attachment in the making phase and by about eight to ten months they have clear-cut attachment meaning they are clearly obviously attached to their caregiver and they'll have a healthy fear of strangers behaviorists view attachment as learned behavior based on caregivers attention and we know that attachment is an instinct that we have thanks to Harry Harlow's experiments. He discovered that we have an inborn need for contact comfort. And he did this using the famous Harlow monkey experiments. So this is yet another example of psychologists being the absolute worst. There's really no other explanation for it. So what Harlow would do is he would take monkeys and take them away from their birth mothers. And you would have them raised in a cage for their entire childhood. And these are all little baby monkeys. And he would have them be fed by a wire mother. So there's this mother that is wire and has milk. And there's this mother that sometimes has milk, but also has a more familiar face to the monkey and has warm cloth wrapped around it. It's nothing else, that's it. And so what Harlow would do is he would intentionally place the monkey on the cloth mother, but the thing was the cloth mother didn't have any milk. And so then he would just wait. How long would the monkey stay with the cloth mother that can't feed him until he finally leaves and goes to the wire mother to get food? Turns out the monkeys would stay with the cloth mother that had no food for hours and hours and hours. It was only once they finally got very hungry that they left the cloth mother and fed from the wire mother. And then as soon as they were finished feeding, they went back to the cloth mother who was the only mother they ever knew. So we know thanks to this experiment, this very sad experiment, that this was an example of us having an inborn need for attachment. And we see the same thing in children. Conrad Lawrence was an ethologist, and he said that attachment was an instinct, which we just saw with the monkeys. And that there is a critical period in which we can develop attachment, and that we will lose that instinct if we miss this critical period. And we know this to actually be true due to case studies involving babies from Russian orphanages. There have been many cases of children from Russian orphanages not being able to attach to their adoptive parents. And this is because when they were babies in that Russian orphanage, nobody played with them. Nobody gave them attention. Instead, they were fed and they were clothed. And then other than that, they were left in their beds all day, every day. So they never had an opportunity to develop that sense of attachment and that stayed with them once they actually had parents and they were now older children. When you attach to your parent, it's known as imprinting. If you have pets, they have most likely imprinted with you. If you ever have your dog staring into your eyes, that is usually a sign that your dog is loving you, that it sees you as a parent, that sort of thing. Also, fun fact, when dogs 
in studies that we've done recently, when dogs are looking at their parent at their owners, they will look at them and it'll be very similar in terms of brain activity to how a child looks at their parent. And when the owners of those pets are looking at their dog and we monitor their brain activity, it is very similar uh, to the brain activity of a parent looking at their child. So it's very interesting stuff, this attachment sort of stuff. Ainsworth, and who we've already talked about, and Bowlby also found in their research that attachment is instinctive in humans. So all of this is just supporting these ideas. Now, thanks to the strange situation devised by Ainsworth, we know that an infant's behavior is observed in an unfamiliar room with toys, while the infant's mother or caregiver and a stranger move in and out of the room in a structured series of simulations. This experiment helped us to come up with different types of attachment. We have the secure attachment, we have insecure avoidant, which we've already talked about, and insecure ambivalent and insecure disorganized. Disorganized is a new one. It simply means that they don't really know what to do. They're a mixture of the other two. Secure attachment is indicated when an infant explores the situation freely in the presence of their mother, but displays distress when mom leaves and responds enthusiastically when she returns. A caregiver that is sensitive and responsive to an infant's needs are more likely to develop a secure attachment. Insecure avoidant is indicated by exploration, but minimal interest in mom the infant showing little distress when mom leaves and avoiding her when she returns. Insecure ambivalent is indicated by the infant seeking closeness to the mother and not exploring the situation. They have high levels of distress when the mom leaves and ambivalent behavior when she returns by both clinging to her but also pushing away from her because they're angry. If they're insecure disorganized, it is marked by the infant's confusion when mom leaves and when she returns. They act disoriented, they seem overwhelmed by the situation, and they do not demonstrate a consistent way of coping with what is happening to them. This leads us to discussing parenting styles. Now, Diana Baumrind was the main person to discuss styles of parenting, and she found a connection between parental behavior and the development of instrumental competence. There are four types of parenting styles. The first is authoritative. This is characterized by reasonable demands and high responses, responsiveness. Authoritative parents might have high expectations for their children, and these parents also give their kids the resources and support they need to succeed. So think back to the Cosbys, uh, how they would be very supportive of their kids, but they also would have high expectations. So the kids still got in trouble, there was still punishments for when they snuck out or something like that, but they also were willing to give them feedback to make them feel better about situations and help them understand why they were in trouble. The authoritarian parent um, has a style of very high expe expectations of their children, but provides very little in terms of feedback and nurturing. This is the because I said so parent. Do it because I told you to. End of. I'm not going to try and make you feel better about it. I'm just going to make you do it because I want you to do it. Period. You should do it because I told you to. Permissive parenting is the opposite. They have low demands but are very nurturing to their children. So this is the I'm not a regular mom, I'm a cool mom sort of situation. Or if you're going to drink, I'd rather you drink at the house. These parents do not expect mature behavior from their children and often seem more like a friend than a parental figure. The final parenting style is the uninvolved parenting style. These parents make few to no demands of their children and are often indifferent or dismissive or even completely neglectful to their kids. So they're not really a part of their child's life. And so as a result, the kid doesn't really have a parent in that sense. Here are the outcomes of each of these different parenting styles. So authoritative parents tend to have the greatest self-reliance with their children. Their children have the best self-esteem, social competence, and achievement motivation. Children with authoritarian parents tend to become withdrawn or aggressive as adults. Children with permissive parents become less mature, are often impulsive, moody, and aggressive. They become brats, essentially. 
and children with uninvolved parents are the most likely children to use drugs. Okay, so those were all of the major theories that have to do with development. Please make sure that you're studying each of these theories. We've talked a lot about how they affect you as a child. Going forward with the rest of this uh, presentation, we're going to be quickly going through adulthood and adolescence. But the same theories will apply, so it should be pretty quick. We know physically that as a teenager, you have a growth spurt and you interact with puberty. This begins with the appearance of certain secondary sex characteristics, and in women, they develop menarche, which usually occurs between 11 and 14, or your first period. Looking back at the other stages, let's talk about Piaget's formal operation stage for his cognitive development stage. So Piaget said that you were at the end once you became a teenager. By this time, you've mastered classification, logical thought, ability to hypothesize, you have abstract thinking, you're able to deal with hypothetical situations, and you also have to deal with things like adolescent egocentrism. Teenagers tend to deal with being a little self-centered quite a bit, and they also will experience two phenomena known as the imaginary audience and the personal fable. The imaginary audience is why everything is the absolute worst thing in the entire world when it happens to a teenager. Why no one has ever dealt with anything like this and they tend to be very dramatic, right? That's because for them, they believe someone is always watching them and they feel incredibly embarrassed. So they always feel like someone is watching them and if something bad happens to them, then they're gonna feel embarrassed about it and that's going to compound the emotions that they have about the situation already. The personal fable is the idea that their story is more significant than anyone else's. That no one else has had to suffer like this poor teenager has. That their life is so unfair that other kids have it way easier than them. That kind of thing. So that's the personal fable. Talking about moral reasoning with Kohlberg's post-conventional level, we know that most people don't reach this level. That judgment is based on your own moral standards. At stage five of this level, laws are made to preserve order, but exceptions can occur. And at stage six, you believe that adherence must be given to universal ethical principles. So not necessarily the law, but what you believe is the right thing to do. Kohlberg's theory shows higher levels of moral reasoning in boys. Another researcher, Carol Gilligan, argued that the difference is the result of socialization, that the reasons that he saw this difference was because girls make judgments based on the needs of others, while boys make judgments based on logic. So girls have been socialized, according to Carol Gilligan, to use more empathy when making moral decisions, whereas boys will make logical decisions. So they don't really think about how it affects other people, they only look at what is the easiest solution, essentially. What is the most logical solution? What makes sense? So that's the difference. Moving on to Erickson's social and emotional development in adolescence, we know that they deal with a ton of conflicts with parents, usually in early adolescence and most intense in mid-adolescence. Uh, there is a reason that a lot of parents dread the teenage years. Teenagers often will deal with mood swings like depression or loneliness during this time frame. They're also more likely to take risks, to be impulsive, and their peer relationships will become more important than their familial relationships. There is also the concern for teenage pregnancy. Now that you've hit puberty, you can get pregnant. You can make someone else pregnant. Uh, and so those risk-taking behaviors, those activities, those risky activities, so those impulsive inclinations include wanting to have sex. And so that is why teenage pregnancy can rush through the roof, especially in locations where uh, contraceptives may be frowned upon or where uh, abstinence-only education is what is encouraged. In every single situation in a school zone where abstinence-only education is used, we have found that teen pregnancy rates have soared. Now, when talking about social and emotional development, the question with teenagers becomes, is it going to be stormy and stressful, or is it going to be calm and joyous? It's either one or the other. There is no happy middle ground here. So with teenagers, it will be either very stressful 
or very joyous depending on the day. Independence is the main challenge of adolescence, according to Erickson. So they are trying to become adults, but they're not quite adults yet. And so they struggle with this concept. Erickson also said, as we've already mentioned, that they are struggling with the stage of ego identity versus role diffusion. And adolescent sexuality also comes into play. About 50% of American teens engage in sexual intercourse. And this is regardless of what you teach them or how much you encourage them to you know, stay safe or to uh, wait until marriage or whatever it is that you want to encourage them to do. Uh, just know that statistically speaking, 50% of American teens will engage in sexual intercourse. So moving on from teenagers, let's talk about adults. We know that as we grow older, our bodies change. Uh, this is largely in part to our genetics, but also environment. Uh, for women, they will develop menopause. We know that as we grow older, our perception changes. We uh, might develop presbyopia. We might develop cataracts. We might have hearing issues from our entire life of listening to really loud rock music, for example. Uh, memory can sometimes decline. What one thing we do find is that in older adults, their episodic recall actually improves. And it's their working memory that can sometimes be a little difficult. When looking at physical development, we know that as a young adult, usually you are at the height of your physical prowess. But by middle adulthood, you have a gradual physical decline. And women, of course, will experience menopause. By late adulthood, your bones have become brittle and you have a greater risk for fall. The reason why is because you probably heard the expression, I fell and broke my hip, but that is an incorrect expression. Usually what happens is that your bones were so brittle that you stepped wrong. The shock from that step caused your hip to break and then you fell. So you also will see a slower response time among late adulthood. Here's just a handy chart to show the different ways in which we age throughout our body. So feel free to pause this video if you would like to study this some. Going back to Piaget's theory of cognitive development, we know that creativity can be evidenced throughout our lifetime, but that memory functioning declines with age. We have a difference between both crystallized intelligence and fluid intelligence. Crystallized intelligence is locked in intelligence. It is basic facts, things that you know about yourself, your name, where you're from, your social security number. That is a crystallized intelligence piece of information. It is knowledge that you already have. Fluid intelligence is your ability to adapt to new situations. Uh, it is the ability to learn new things and then apply that new knowledge, that recently learned knowledge, to a situation. Tasks that require speed and visual spatial skills tend to decline in their performance as we get older. Alzheimer's disease is a progressive form of mental deterioration. It affects 1% of people at age 60 and about 50% of people past the age of 85. But what you need to remember is that this is a disease. It is not a normal progression. Not every person develops Alzheimer's disease. And it is actually possible to prevent yourself from developing it as well by taking certain medications, by eating certain foods and exercising your brain as much as you can, all those sorts of things. Going back to Erickson and his theory of social and emotional development, we know that a great variety is based on cultural expectations and individual behavior patterns. But there are certain trends. We know that each generation tends to become more optimistic than the generation before it. And that as we grow older, we tend to also grow psychologically healthier. This is typically because as you grow older and you get to middle age, you've experienced a lot more. And so you've learned how to deal with more of life's stressors. When you are a young adult, you tend to pursue some sort of dream. You have a blueprint for your life and you have expectations for how your life is gonna go. Erickson would say that during young adulthood, you deal with intimacy versus isolation. By middle adulthood, you deal with generativity versus stagnation and then the midlife transition or that midlife crisis. And then in late adulthood, you deal with ego integrity versus despair. And so that is it for the human development chapter. I know that was quite a lot of information, but again, 
As always, please make sure you are turning in all of your assignments by the due date, and I will see you next time for the next lecture.